Hey everybody, happy November. Uh, yesterday was the premiere of Doctor Who Flux, Series 13, The Halloween Apocalypse, and uh, I caught it on cable, naturally because I'm going to be reviewing Doctor Who Flux in my remastered video essay. I was very lucky to catch it. I almost didn't. It's been a while since I've caught a Doctor Who episode on the airtime. But I caught The Halloween Apocalypse, I took some notes on it, I'm gonna go through them. But first, I'm gonna start at what I thought I was going to get going into Doctor Who Flux. Uh, ignore the fact that I've changed shirts, it's been a couple hours. But yeah, before I get into the notes and the nitty gritty of the story, and I, I guess this is your spoiler warning now, uh, I am going to be going in deep into everything that happens in the episode and how I felt about it and where I think it's going. But going into the Halloween apocalypse, the first episode, I was totally convinced that we would have some setup of the big stuff over the series in, the, you know, Doctor Who Flux. Uh, that would be set up at the start, and then afterwards, because in all the promotional material for episode one, we had a ton of Weaving Angels, I was assuming this was going to be a solo-focused Weaving Angels story. I was very excited for that, because I love Weaving Angels, and it's been a while since we've seen them. I was very interested in how Chibnall was going to write them. I'll get into the Weeping Angels in this story later. But that's what I was expecting. Uh, I did not get that. So, the Halloween Apocalypse. I'm going to summarize the plot real quick here. Uh, so we start, the Doctor and Yaz are traveling on their own after losing Ryan and Graham. I have seen all of Chibnall at this point, by the way, so I know that, that this comes from Revolution of the Daleks, of course. So I'm all caught up. Uh, but they were traveling alone, well, together, I guess, but without just the two of them. And there's, they get into some hijinks, whatever, and then, and then we get a flashback to 1820s Liverpool with some people mining, and they're saying, stop mining. And then the guy's like, no, there's chaos or something. And then it cuts away, and then we never cut back to that again for the rest of the episode. And then afterwards, we have uh, the introduction of Dan, the new companion. Uh, but it's Halloween. Uh, the TARDIS is leaking some shit, so it's like the TARDIS is decomposing or something. And then uh, a dog person, a dog alien, breaks into John Bishop's house, Dan's house, and then kidnaps him, and then we don't know what his motivations are, so he just kidnaps Dan, and then the Doctor and Yaz are tracking him down, and then there's a new character who's like River Song again, where we, she knows the Doctor in the future, they haven't met yet, and then there's a weeping angel in this story, and then we meet Vinder, and then we meet the Flux, and then we meet Sontarans, and then we find out that the dog was actually nice and trying to save the humans from the flux, which is basically like destructive space that's consuming the galaxy or whatever. It's just like a big fucking event that's consuming everything. So that's the flux for the series. And we see it des devour some planets. Uh, Vinder almost gets destroyed in his little like scouting thing, but he gets he jettisons a life pod. And then we also meet some skeleton people who apparently has some history with the Doctor or whatever. Uh, but they're vaporizing people, and there's a, he has a sister or something. Who cares? And then we also have... What do we have? I think that's pretty much it. So there's a lot in this story. And my biggest problem with it, and I'll get into the little... It, I'll go chronologically from the episode, but my biggest thing with it is... I have notes. Big thing. Everything is happening in this episode. Skeleton People, Dogman, Dan, Weeping Angels, Vindir, The Division, The Flux, and Sontarans makes it hard to feel like an episode episode instead of a first part to Flux, which is what it is. So it makes it hard to actually review this episode because I'm assuming most of this is going to be picked up in the second one and these aren't going to be episodic episodes at all based on the way this one turned out. This was the Weeping Angel one from the marketing. There's only one scene with a Weeping Angel in it. Literally one scene. And like a flashback at the end to the Weeping Angel scene, whatever. There's literally one scene where a woman is trying to get into her house, a Weeping Angel's in the street, she fumbles with her keys, it's a tense scene, and she gets caught by the Weeping Angel, the door opens, there's a Weeping Angel in the doorway, we cut away, and that's all the Weeping Angel we get in the episode. So I'm assuming we're gonna continue to see them, we also, we don't know why the Weeping Angel is there at all. It comes out of fucking nowhere. Like, we're doing the Dogman stuff and the Skeleton stuff, and all of a sudden, there's a Weeping Angel in the street. And we're like, hey, that's why I wanted to watch this episode. And the scene is over before it even starts. So, 
That was a little disappointing. I really wanted a Weeping Angel episode. That's okay. But si considering this is going to be Trial of a Time Lord 2 with Doctor Who Flux, I'm assuming we're all serialization here. It's all going to be one big story, and things are going to make sense as the other episodes come out. And it d really depends how it all ends up. But I think for this one, I honestly don't know how to feel. Anyway, we're going to go chronologically for all the things that I took note of, and I'm just going to go rapid fire through them. I'll give some context for the things that I haven't given context for already, uh, but we're just going to start from what I have listed. So uh, at the start, we have the cold open where the Doctor and Yaz are traveling on their lonesome. They're attacked by some people. They're hung hanging upside down. You see it in the trailers. They're hanging upside down from these, like, anti-grav bars over some acid and there's drones that are going to shoot them so it's all very high stakes and and slapsticky in that doctor who way and right out the gates we have some immediately good promising dialogue of yaz uh actually characterized as something of a uh equal to the doctor and antagonizing her uh for getting them into the situation that they're in and i thought that was quite good uh i wasn't expecting that so early but the thing with chibnall stories is we have, we have good characterization at the start, but once the, uh, the plot starts, it all evaporates and they become just exposition characters to state what's happening in the scene so that the six-year-olds can keep up. So this was a, a good promise that he was keeping uh, in format with that. I needed to see that throughout the rest of the episode, and there was some of that not so much in other places. So in a lot of ways, I felt like this episode was inconsistent in its characterization, much like most of Chibnall's run, but to a lesser degree, I would say. It's, it's mostly an improvement, but not markedly. Uh, we have some good effects of them. This in, so this entire environment is basically CG. They're like green screened and composited into the scene. Good compositing, obviously the effects and budget isn't the problem with Chibnall. Uh, it's pretty much everything else. But it was good effects. And then after that, we get the credits. They dive into the TARDIS uh, through some hijinks or whatever, and then they land on a mattress. The handcuffs come off. And then I think it's credits right there. There might be some other dialogue with talking about, I don't know, maybe Yaz being pissed with the Doctor or something. But anyway, after that credits roll, we have a new theme. Uh, it's kind of a grittier and edgier theme. I quite liked it. I think it's the best of uh, the... The 13th Doctor themes, I think. And then after that, we get the cut to 1820s Liverpool. I wrote no notes of this because it's such a weird scene. I'm assuming it's going to tie in at some point later, but it's just the one scene. You know, there's nothing. They just talk and they're mining. And it's like a three minute scene, whatever. So that, and anyway, that's there. And then after that, we have Dan. Dan gets introduced. There's just a tiny scene of him talking. And then he's talking to. Uh, I think her name is Deborah. I think her name is Deborah. Anyway, they, uh, they're going on a date, or it's not a date, but it's the typical cute dialogue. Oh, we're not going on a date, yeah. And it's awkward and funny in that way, so that's, that's something that we're getting. And after that, we get the Skeleton Man introduction, which is one of Chibnall's big new villains. Uh, we meet him, and he's imprisoned on a planet. Like, we meet him, and that's the first time we see him. And then there's two guards here. One of them has apparently been guarding him her whole life. And the other one is, she's passing the torch onto him. They're meeting, they're walking up to him. And then it just immediately breaks out and kills them by uh, apparently disintegrating them with his mind. So this guy's very powerful. Uh, take note of that. And then we see Dan in his house. This is Halloween. The story takes place during Halloween night. So we have trick-or-treaters coming up. And then an alien busts through his back door with a big axe, and this is the dog man that's in all the promotional stuff. This is their new dog man character. And he comes in and he's like, come with me. So he's like kidnapping him or whatever, but it's Halloween and Dan thinks it's a costume. He's like, that's a good costume. You're gonna have to pay for my door though. I quite like that scene. And then uh, he gets shot by like the square gun and then he gets kidnapped. And then what I had to say about that scene is Dogman, I think, is the new Strax or something. And what I meant by that is he's played off for Comic Relief. This is the new Comic Relief. And since Tribnall is doing his uh, new antagonistic Sontarans with the new design and they're all creepy and stuff, and we see them in this episode later, uh, I thought that this would be his new Comic Relief alien or something that, like an alien that we're not supposed to take seriously because that's the whole thing with it. It's a 
dog, and he's kind of a bonehead, and he comes from a warrior race, or at least he's characterized as that. But it's a dog, and he's adorable, and no one takes him seriously. And I think that works a lot better than the Sontaran stuff that we got earlier, although I do like Strax, so I thought this would be a new comic relief alien. And I did like him, honestly. He was played well, and uh, I thought his dialogue was quite good, so he was a good character. And then after that, we cut away to, like, the Arctic, and this is the thing with Chibnall's stories. In, in Resolution, Spyfall, Praxius, and a few others, I think, uh, we're just, like, all across the globe. Like, so much shit is happening everywhere. I don't know what his fascination with that is. Anyway, uh, we're in the Arctic or something, and there's these two random people doing science or something, and then a UFO shows up, and they're like, what's that doing there? And then we cut away. So that was a scene, and I don't think I took note of it, but we meet Vinder, I think, after that, or maybe before that. Uh, it's all around this that all the stuff gets set up. So Vinder, I quite like his characterization. He's just like some futuristic dude sitting in a junker spaceship it's some sort of like outpost where he's watching the planets and he's got a little calm he radios back to whatever his home planet is and he, he talks about how pretty the space stuff is i think he's characterized fantastically you know and that was something i took notice of the characterization a lot better i think these and because this is going to be dr reflux and all of these characters are going to get some depth i'm assuming dogman is getting a ton of depth vendor is definitely going to get some more depth the skeleton people whatever i'm assuming these characters are, are getting a lot more attention than they did in the episodic one-offs that we had before, so. It's to be expected that these are getting more characterization, but it was still quite good. It's important to take note of that. Uh, but yeah, then we meet the Flux, which is just a big cataclysmic event that is destroying planets. It's just like this big fucking mass of, like, an anomaly that consumes planets and disintegrates them. And we, we don't know that that's connected to anybody yet. It's just, like, an anomaly that's destroying everything. And so that's coming to consume planets, and we see it disintegrate planets, Vinder watches it eat them, and then it's coming for him next. So he has to jettison out, and so he's in like a little escape craft. So that was our nice little action scene with him. Uh, I think he was a nice character. So far the characters are okay, but the plot is just a complete fucking mess. And then after that we get uh, Dan, again, who is now in a cage on the dog man's spaceship, and then we have some funny dialogue with them. It's, you know, like, like a swap sees where the dog is in the human's position. He's the big, powerful one. And then Dan is in the cage like a dog. And it's funny because it's not supposed to be like that. And Dogman has a funny British voice. So he's making silly jokes, but he's a dog. And it's funny. And there was some dialogue here that I felt was a bit clunky and a bit, a bit like I was six years old again where they're explaining to me that, hey, uh, he, he makes a threat to Dan like, I'm gonna kill you, and then Dan's like, you wouldn't kill me, because you didn't before, but it's such a long line, and it goes on for a long time, I'm like, I already knew all this shit. Obviously, as a characterization line for Dan, he's characterized as someone who really just takes this in his stride, all the time travel stuff, he doesn't really stop and just be completely gobsmacked at it. Uh, so as a characterization line, I think it was okay, but the line itself could have been a lot better. And then after that, we meet, like, Oh yeah, there's a new character, uh, so we meet a new, she's Claire, her name is Claire, uh, she's basically River Song again, and it's a character, basically it's a character that the Doctor hasn't met yet, she's met him, and I'm assuming during Flux we're gonna see her factor into this, and I'm assuming she's the one that gets caught by the Weeping Angel, by the way, uh, this is when we get the Weeping Angel scene, it's one scene, she gets caught by the Weeping Angel, and then I'm assuming she gets pl displaced in time, and then she'll come back into the plot later, and then it'll all wrap around to the beginning again. So that was that. Uh, we don't know why the Weeping Angel's here, obviously, so that was a question that I had. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we're back in the Arctic, and the skeleton dude, who is just going around disintegrating people, uh, disintegrates the two people in the Arctic. Again, these people are just here. Uh, he disintegrates the man, and then the lady turns into a skeleton person, and that turns out to be his sister, which happened. I don't know how to feel about it, to be honest. Uh, it just kind of felt like a weird scene, uh, but that was that. And then uh, the doctor, who has been... Uh, yeah, we haven't been talking about the doctor. Basically, the TARDIS is like disintegrating or whatever. There's some ooze leaking out of it, uh, and it's making the TARDIS door... 
uh, move into different places like the ground. They come out through the ground of the TARDIS, which I thought was a cool idea. So that's happening. And she's like, there's doing the whole thing where she's got some secret to tell. And there is some actual depth here. I'm enjoying that. And Yaz is kind of characterized as a bit more of a Clara syndrome at this point where she's kind of gotten used to, to TARDIS life and she's more of an equal to the Doctor. They, uh, she's like on the same wavelength to them. They're kind of working together as a team better as opposed to the, the, the wooden planks that occupied series 11 and 12. So I was grateful for this characterization of Yaz and I hope it gets developed throughout Flux. But that was a good idea. The thing is with this is it's always inconsistent. Like in some scenes, Yaz is com competitive with the Doctor and an equal with her, and they kind of butt heads and whatnot. And in other scenes, she's just asking questions, moving the plot forward. I, I, I mean, I, and it's with with every character. Like even the Master had that. Sometimes the Master is characterized very well, and sometimes he's plot man, or sometimes there's a clunky, cringe joke or something. Like it's, it plagues so much of his writing. Uh, I feel like if just a bit more consistency was deployed with this, you know, we would have had some actual characters here. But it's the way that, anyway, the characterization of Yaz is quite good, and I enjoyed that dynamic when it is apparent. So there's that dynamic, and they're tracking Dan because of energy readings, whatever. So they're basically one step behind Dan and the Dogman. So they board the Dogman ships. The Doctor confronts Dogman. She says, why do you have this man... And then Yaz goes to rescue Dan from the cage, and the dog man is like, we are saving the humans from the flux, because the flux is coming, and it's going to destroy the earth. Um, and basically the whole idea is that these dog people are actually, there is one dog man for every single human, so it's basically like a man's best thing, friend kind of thing, uh, and they, they all have a, a human that's assigned to them that they have to save and get on their ships, and they all have a ship that are immune to the flux. So they're all going to just kind of have a human and then they all form together in some sort of like massive ship that can live through the flux. Uh, so that happens. So we find that out. The, the dog man is not a bad man. He's actually a very nice dog man, which was nice. I, the way they were characterizing dog man, I didn't, I didn't really think of him as a threat anyway, but uh, that was that. Uh, Yaz and Dan have some dialogue. It's nice. Uh, but the characterization, again, disappears and reappears at a moment's notice for no reason, uh, for some jokes or whatever. But the dialogue is okay. Uh, and what I had to say about that was, dialogue is a mixed bag. Sometimes characters are characterized, sometimes they aren't. It makes it hard to connect with them. In some instances, I like Dan, and sometimes he'll say the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, much like all of Chidnall's characters. And I do agree with that. Uh, sometimes Dan is characterized very well, he's very empathetic, He's a cool dude, you know, he's funny. And in some instances, he's just plot man. Or he'll say something ridiculous, something that no human would ever say in that situation. Uh, and then after that, so Dan and Yaz have been rescued, and the dog man is like, why are you stealing my human? He's my human. And then Dan is like, I'm not your, what does he say? Oh, he's talking about humanity being saved from the, from the flux from the dog, by the dog people. He says, we don't want your protection as the Doctor and the Dog Man are talking together. Yaz and, uh, Yaz and Dan come from the back, having rescued him, and he just yells at him and butts into the conversation. And then Yaz is like, you're supposed to be sneaking quietly. I like that joke. Anyway, that was a poor explanation of that joke. It was a good scene. Uh, and then after that, I uh, talked about Yaz. Yaz seems to have adapted and has some Clara syndrome going on, which I've already mentioned. And again, is portrayed stupidly inconsistently. I agree. Uh, oh yeah, and then after that, we get the reveal that Skeleton Man is basically the new master to the Timeless Doctors. So pre-Hartnell, uh, this guy has been fighting the Doctor for forever, but of course the Doctor doesn't remember her because of the memory, memory wipe of Timeless Child. And my biggest problem with this where this is going and my biggest fear going forward is Chibnall doubling down on Timeless Child. Um, it's without a doubt the dumbest decision he's ever made as I quote myself. I agree. Uh, it was fan reception was insanely negative. It destroyed almost every facet of the show. I don't like the first thing I would be thinking of if I was Chibnall was how to reverse engineer everything I've done. First thing I would do I mean, if it was me I would 
make the master the timeless child. We can keep everything in continuity. But the master was dumb and didn't realize that it was him or something. And then everything is fixed. Not that I would wrap it up so cleanly like that. I would have some story beats to follow it. But that's probably what I would do to fix it. But the fact that we're doubling down here makes me doubt the future of Doctor Who in general, honestly. And if Russell T. Davies and his series is going to be forced to continue down this narrative avenue. I hope not. I don't know how to fix it at this point. If we're doubling down here, and if this is where this is going, that we're doubling down that the Timeless Doctors did happen and that there's villains that the Doctor hasn't met or doesn't remember... I mean, it's just, it's just more of what I never wanted in a million years to happen in Doctor Who happening here. So I had huge problems with that, obviously, as I have huge problems with Timeless Child. Um, but that happened. We got the reveal. It's, I mean, it's important to see where this goes in the, for, in, in the future. But uh, that happened. Uh, and I felt like that was kind of dumb. Uh, and then I had a note, I like Dogman. I agree with myself. And then we get the flux is coming in, and then uh, so the flux is coming in a bit more quickly than people expected. The dogman race doesn't have time to save all the humans, so the doctor's like, "Make your ships go in this formation because they can link together in a grid because that's the way they're designed." So they have all of the dogman ships shield Earth, like the whole fucking planet, like a big ass wall. And uh, so I wrote the ship shielding Earth. Don't know if it's cool or dumb. I think it's cool, but I don't know. Pretty much how I feel. It, it's a narrative beat. And then we have some Tarans happening. And they're, uh, they're planning an attack on Earth. And that's how the episode ends on a cliffhanger. And then... Yeah, that's pretty much it. So the episode ends on a cliffhanger. The Doctor is attacked by the Flux. The Flux is going to eat the TARDIS. And then she's like, here, have Vortex Energy. And then she opens the heart of the TARDIS. It doesn't do anything. And then we're like... And then she's like, oh, it's... I'm gonna die. And that's the... That's how it ends. That's the cliffhanger. Without, of course, exempt from the, the montage of all the... What, 13 plot points that we've set up in this one episode. So, I mean... It was. I, it's important to note that this is the first part of Flux, and we're going heavily heavy serialization here with Flux. But the characterization inconsistent. Biggest thing with it. Some of the characters are characterized well, but I'm, I have a feeling with characters like Dogman and Vinder and Skeleton people, their dialogue is just going to be a complete nutter mixed bag, and that is one of the biggest problems with characterization that you cannot fuck up. You, you, your character has to be consistent. They have to be well characterized in every fucking line because the illusion gets destroyed. You know, I, I can't connect with a character that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't react the way that the, sh the, the show is building him up to react as. Same with somebody like Dan who like completely breaks his character to make a dumb joke. Or any number of characters from all of Shibnall's run. They're all culprits. You know, it's a big, it's a big issue for me. That's, that's what I'm going to talk about in the actual essay. So you got a bit of a sneak peek of my uh, thoughts on Chibnall overall. There are some intricacies with that that, of course, I'm going to deep dive into when I actually do the reviews on the remastered video essay, which I have not yet written, obviously, because I have to get through Flux. But in general, honestly, hugely disappointing in terms of what I was expecting, which is a Weeping Angel solo story setting up Flux. I was fully expecting that Chibnall was going to learn from his lessons and really buck up his writing. I expected we, we would be reverse engineering Timeless Child. We didn't get that. We got the opposite, which I wasn't happy about. But in general, some characters are good, some characters are promising, but not a lot to go off right now. And some elements that were dumb and redundant, so... That's how I felt. Uh, it's more of Chibnall, but I guess a little tiny bit better. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Bye-bye.